Hagiography is not the same as biography or much less scientific history, but it's rather a question of telling the story of a saint with a view to communicating values. So when, uh, when we um, uh, look at those values with a view to extracting from them something about the history of Bernard, we've got to realise that the facts are there, but they are embedded in interpretations. And that they may, may be the truth, but they're certainly not the whole truth. Because any other facts which tend not to support the values have probably been uh, put under the carpet. They've probably been left aside. It's the truth, but not the whole truth. And it's the truth that is embedded in, in a framework of values. And so when we approach the lives, we've got to be a little bit careful that we don't just simply take everything as it is. What we have in many examples of ancient historiography is the effort to translate raw and unconnected factual material into a literary presentation of events. So you have a number of events of a person's life, and the big thing is to try and put them together into some form of unity, to try and give them some cohesion, and therefore you need a lot of bridging, a lot of connections that are made. The historian attempted to produce a work of art that people would enjoy reading, <laughs> and would be marked by style, and not simply a catalogue of items of information. <coughs> Therefore, when he found himself frustrated by a dearth of relevant details, he became somewhat inventive. Not that this was an undisciplined or unprincipled procedure. It was done cautiously, never moving far from what was solidly known. You wouldn't say that Bernard had three wives, for example, if it were known that he only had one. Um, you know, he didn't just invent things that were totally outrageous, but he just kind of adjusted the picture a little bit. Uh, if it wasn't right, he just um, gave a little bit more finesse, a bit more detail. It does not take much imagination to see that the child is the father of the man, and so to begin a process of retrojecting adult qualities into the early years of a famous life. We see this in the apocryphal Gospels. I don't know about you, but when I was with the nuns for about three years, my first three years of schooling, they seemed to think the apocryphal Gospels were far more interesting than the real ones. So we had stories of Jesus creating little birds out of clay and breathing life into them, and um, man who cursed St. Joseph was thrown off a cliff or something like that, and all these little stories kind of projecting the powers that later became associated with the adult Christ back into the child. We see the same with Bernard. Retrojecting adult qualities into the early years of a famous life. These, of course, have to be illustrated by incidents. These can be borrowed from existing biographies, so if somebody else has written about a similar event, you can borrow it. Uh, if we know uh, one saint uh, had this kind of experience, well, why not another? modified to suit the special circumstances of the subject of the researchers. It's a bit like the German, um, the German uh, and I think also the French media uh, with regard to um, Prince Charles's um, intended wife. This was before he was married. And I remember reading an article on this, particularly the, the Germans were very inventive, is that they had three photographs. of the, They were the same photographs which they put through different colour processes to produce different dresses and just change the heads of them. <laughs> they had a photograph of Charles with his arm around a girl and they used the same th photograph three times with three different heads on it to show three different girls <laughs> according to who was regarded as the current favourite to become his wife. Well, this is what they do in a, in a sense. They take something out of stock 
and modify it slightly so that it would fit existing cir circumstances. Modify to, sit, uh, to suit the special circumstances of the subject of the researchers. If there's a question of a saint, all the conventional indications of sainthood can be assumed. Portents and prophecies, precocious miracles, and astonishing influence. So we'll ask Andre all about that. Often the budding saint can be advanced as a paradigm of a particular uh, spirituality. And we'll see with regard, if you look very closely, or the more I look at, at the Vita Prima, the more I see uh, not St. Bernard, but William of St. Thierry. And uh, St. Bernard is presenting even as a kind of hermit when he was a schoolboy. You know, things like that. He's portrayed of being of sickly disposition. Anybody here of sickly disposition? You're probably a saint. <laughs> it was a great old thing. It's one of the things, the first things that he mentions, how somebody who is so weak of body should be um, so powerful in the spirit. As a great sinner is all, an alternative. In Augustine, another alternative. To show that he sinned, well, I can see we have a few candidates for that one. Um, when we come to write your life, we'll do it after, the, after that kind of manner. We'll pull down the, the library of of incidents that are appropriate to a great sinner and repentant. A soul of kindness, a hate, lover of the physical world or a hater of vanity and so forth. So just to get used to this idea and to try and become a little bit sympathetic towards it, not to let our kind of vision shaftlik ideas of what's appropriate for a uh, historiographical work dominate our thinking, saying that they were producing something a bit different from what we call history. But we can find food for our historical interests in these works if we know what to ignore and what to, what, to, what to concentrate on. The historian who does such thing is not necessarily being dishonest. He is operating out of a different model of history to that which we expect. It's not an academic exercise in objectivity as far as he is concerned, uh, what is sometimes called dust coat history. In other words, like working in a laboratory, they put on a, a dust coat and everything is examined in precise scientific uh, objectivity and measured and classified and put in its glass case and, and, and strung together. It's not that sort of history, it's much more human. But it's an overtly interpretative use of the past as a means of proclaiming a message. You've got a pencil in your hand, underline as a means of proclaiming a message. Because it's not simply telling us facts. This is a, the way into understanding what sort of writing it is. It's giving a message. Now let me tell you, brothers and sisters, about the monks in such and such a monastery. They are all wondrously kind. They listen attentively during lectures. They don't read comics while I'm giving talks. And so... I'm giving you, an, an, it may very well be an objective account of what's, what's um, happening in some strange monastery, but really there's a message there <laughs> which isn't the same. It may exist, this monastery I'm talking about, and the monks may not read comics during lectures, but the, 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 the message is for the one in the back row to stop reading comics. <laughs> <laughs> an abbot comes back from the general chapter and says, Brethren, I visited this such and such a monastery. And, but there's always a point to the story. It's really objective. There they have a beautiful liturgy and nobody plays the trombone, trombone during the meridian and all this kind of thing. But the point is we should stop doing this or we should change our life. Or I went to such and such a monastery and they've got this series in the library. Perhaps we should think about getting it. But generally in human communications, you know, from the time a dog brings around the lead to its master, it means it wants to go for a walk, the sun is out. Uh, when we tell a fact, there's usually a hook on it. But what's different about these biographies, or these hagiographies, is that they, they had a hook in them, but they knew it was there, and it was perfectly overt, it wasn't dishonest. He's proclaiming a message. That we reckon his work is closer to folklore than to history is our problem, not his. He knew what he was doing, as did his readership. Everybody knew what the game was. The work of a life of a saint was not intended to give you information. It was intended to proclaim a message. The genre contained its own checks and balances. 
and the final subject was the final product was always subject to acceptance by those with knowledge similar or complementary to that of the author. Although in the case of Bernard it was a bit different. Um, there were some Berengarius has a, a beautiful morsel which I really believe is true. I think it's perfectly in character that when St. Bernard was a schoolboy he used to make up dirty ditties. He used to make up naughty songs to be um, uh, sung. And I think that that's probably true. But then after he'd put this out there was a knock at his door one night and a few big strong men came round to explain the matter to him and he withdrew his statement. <laughs> Um, but there is a kind of censorship that can go on and I suggest, I, I, I have a feeling that that was possibly true, that Bernard was rather clever in writing risque verse. And, um, but because this was an item that wasn't popular, he was later constrained to, to recant it. But just generally speaking, uh, the genre, people knew what they were doing and other people could say something different. In fact, before the invention of printing, quality control was somewhat superior, since the copying of any major work was a considerable undertaking. You didn't get your book copied if it was a lot of rubbish. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, if, it, if it was worthless, um, you didn't even get anything to write it on. On the other hand, the gullibility factor may have been higher, especially when a spurious detail especially if it can confirm common, common knowledge, uh, acquired a pattern of authority. In any case, it needs to be remembered there is no intention of deception, merely a little pious fantasy. And everybody knew it, that's what it was. We're just telling, telling stories. The difficult task confronting the modern historian is to establish what is factual and what is fancy. There would be a pro no problem if one could simply dismiss these works as fictional. The annoying thing is that often they do contain historical truth, not only regarding generalities, but also in matters of precise detail. Sometimes, in the absence of other information, one must give a qualified assent to an unsubstantiated assertion, simply because it's not obviously untrue. So, now, the, about the only work that's be really been done that's serious in this line, and it isn't complete, is, is the work of Bredero, Adrian Bredero of Tilburg, not a monk, but of the University of, of Tilburg, who's, who's done various things. And I've quoted a well-known study that's in English there. The primitive lives of Bernard fall into the category we've been discussing. Their primary import is literary and spiritual and not factual. Now, Jean Leclerc, when he was studying this question, identified three themes, uh, following Bredero largely, in the work of William of, of St. Thierry, which became uh, taken over by his successors. One is the strong maternal influence on Bernard, and he's quite strong on this, which is a conventional enough theme, and it's possible. It probably needs a bit more work, but it's, it's a possibility. The second is the outstanding value and holiness of the Cistercian way of life, particularly in its Claravallian form. So there's a bit of a, a trumpeting going on about Clairvaux, and Clairvaux as being superior to other forms of Cistercian life, and um, uh, on the part of William in particular. Hence, according to Leclerc, the biography is not without an apologetic force. It's like a biography of, of Merton coming out from, from, uh, from Gethsemane and trying to show that Gethsemane is somewhat superior to, to Spencer. Um, and mentioning all the things that weren't done there and so forth, you could easily write a biography which would show, you know, that there were other inferior types of Trappist life in America in the 20th century, but we're too charitable to mention them or to criticise them in any way, because as a matter of fact, it's, it's better not to talk about them. <laughs> so you can get away that way. And thirdly, the illnesses, anxieties and problems which Bernard had to overcome.
This becomes a very, it becomes from the first page to the first column. He mentions Bernard's illnesses and so forth. And Leclerc has studied it a bit with a team of doctors and, and psychologists in, in, in Rome at the Gregorian, he told me. Uh, and he said the most interesting. Um, he fed them all the information he could find on Bernard's symptoms and they tried to come up with a, with a diagnosis. I think we may have it eventually, uh, somewhere or other, uh, in the pages to come. These serve to highlight the heroic virtue of the saint and to offer both comfort and challenge to those seeking to emulate him. Uh, when it comes to particularising the problems Bernard faced, William tends to project his own struggles on the subject, albeit clothed in conventional hagiographical forms. In fact, it's fairly clear that the Bernard in the Vita Prima is far more diffident than the real Bernard ever was, who had a problem because he thought he was a steamroller, and he would just go through anything, you know? <laughs> that was his problem, <laughs> whereas B William has him much, much more diffident. Nevertheless, some of the factual information contained in Bernard's lives is supported by other sources, including Bernard's own writings. And so that maybe I should have written this word hagiography, although it is hagiography, it's a special type of genre, which is the life of a saint. Just in brief, we might just say that the point about hagiography is that it's not so much interested in facts as using facts to uh, communicate values. And when it tells the story of St Bernard, the idea is to impart some values. In other words, it's designed for a monastic readership, not just for information, but to form you in the appropriate values that are to be found by saying, Bernard did this, and look at you. Uh, Bernard did this, and this is the way to go. And so if the facts are inconvenient, well, they go in the filing cabinet for the next volume. You don't bother about them. But you only bring forth those facts which enable you to support values. All right, passing from there now, we might just try and look at some of the main uh, features of Bernard's life, um, simply because it's good for us to know some of the details uh, without going into, into too much, too much um, uh, particular uh, elements. In honor of St. Patrick, we better put a green thing on here. So let's just look, to begin with, at the most obvious thing, which is the periods in the life of St. Bernard. And the most convenient way to do this, it seems to me, is to interpret the life of Bernard in a number of concentric circles. So if you're good at drawing circles, draw away. First of all, Bernard stands at the centre. OK. The first period of his life is pre-monastic life, from 1090 to 1113. So he'll be 900 years old in two years' time. So the first, next is the circle of family influence and Bernard also always throughout his life seems to have been a power with his family but you'll notice one of the things about this is the, the kind of naturalness of the progression. Bernard's influence, so to speak, is moving out from his person to those whom he immediately touched. Other people become famous, for example, outside their monastery and eventually are accepted inside their monastery. But Bernard's wasn't, it just went outward. The first people that he showed that he was able to influence was his own family. When he uh, was able to convince uh, his relatives uh, that it was a good idea to go to monastic life, it was a good idea to go to Sito and so forth. Uh, and so he went to the monastery with, with all his friends and the second stage was this stage of, from 1113, to uh, the 1120s. We'll come back on that date, 1113, um, later on. 
but when Bernard began his monastic life in 1113 as a middle 20s, he was mainly concerned with living a mona monastery itself, first as a novice, then as a monk, then as an abbot. Uh, progressively, you can see the kind of influence and his status and his stature uh, growing. Then by 1123 or so, uh, with the publication of works like the Apologia and, and well, er earlier, his uh, contacts with other, other monasteries and making foundations and uh, contacts with people like Norbert, the founder of the Primont's Detention Canons, he's beginning to have an influence beyond his own monastery but also in the order and beyond the order even with other monastic foundations. But the thing I, I, I have to keep coming back to is this idea that he always remained uh, you know, at the centre of these circles. He never sort of removed himself and became only interested in uh, extra monastic things. He was always a monk. So, I mean, history's had millions of, of worldly churchmen <laughs> that have kind of used their church office as a basis for some sort of other power and then, you know, to, to all intents and purposes, uh, forgotten their own base. Bernard remained abbot of Clairvaux till the day he died and um, refused higher honours and everything like that. So into monastic life, and progressively from the 1130s, uh, particularly with his role in the, in the uh, uh, stamping out of the anti-pope and the, the resolution of that kind of problem, he became more and more involved in church activities. And so it's getting wider and wider. And so there's, there's a phrase that's often used of him from 1139 to 1148, particularly with the, uh, uh, with the um, crusade and so forth and the extraordinary amount of travelling that he did on that occasion. He became a, a, one of the early European men. Uh, his travels, which is a very interesting thing to, to follow in his footsteps, see your abbot about it when you go home, uh, <laughs> you'd be away, away from home a good while. And one thing, therefore, we have to know about Bernard is that he probably was a very good horseman, or a very sore monk, one of the two. But um, he certainly spent a lot of his life in the saddle. And um, so, uh, and I think that's interesting for us to think of Bernard the, the horseman. Uh, it doesn't quite gel with some of the, the, the sort of wimpy, limpy type images that we have of Bernard. But rather, he was, he, he was a much-travelled man and, and had a lot of contact and so forth. And uh, then things start to change. The next period in his life, he starts to mellow. Some of his best writings that come from this period, 1149 to 1153, when his health deteriorated, but he kept writing or dictating right to the very end and uh, died in 1153. And uh, his canonization, just because we had some room, is 11, uh, 1177, which means there would have been plenty of people around who, um, uh, who uh, knew him uh, when he was actually canonized. I've, I've put it in different form there uh, on the page pre-monastic life, monastic life, ecclesiastical superstar. Well, that's, that's really what he was. He was every man's, uh, you know, if you want a job done, get Bernard to do it. Uh, and he, he's, he progressively became that. Let's just look at the chronology on the other, uh, next pages. I didn't do any work much on chronology yet, although I'm, I'm trying to design a program to do some work on it, but there are all sorts of this is just taken from, a, from the back of the volume of Bernard de Clairvaux, which the History Commission of the Order put out in 53. And it's, it's highly selective. In other words, it just gives some ideas. In the summer of 1090, he was, burn, he was born uh, birth of Bernard of Fontaine. We've got one of his relatives here, haven't we? Probably. <laughs> Your relative, are you? You sure? Illegitimate son? 
that's, that's what, the, <laughs> what we don't find in the Vita Prima. And, and more especially, the third son of Teskel and the Red, his father was local communist, that's why he was called Teskel and the Red, and Aleph of Montbar. And uh, that, that's hoity-toity society. She came from the rather best circles. The Montbars were people. Um, Teskelin was, okay, he was a, a, a knight and a respected uh, middle-class noble, but um, the Montbars were the people to be seen with. Um, Aleth died when he was 13, or probably 1st of September, 1103, just as he was entering adolescence, um, uh, William of St. Thierry says. Then Bernard entered in 1113. This is very funny because there has been a great conspiracy. You know, you don't have to have, be paranoid to find conspiracies. But um, a lot of the manuscripts actually give 1112 as the date of Bernard's entry with 30 others. I wonder, could anybody guess why? Why they be? Yeah, so the, see, La Ferte was founded that year, and they didn't want people to think that um, that uh, you know the the Cito was actually growing and blossoming before Bernard came, and so if in doubt, change it. It doesn't correspond with the data. The birth of the order was the arrival of Bernard and his thirty companions, but that was a year after they started growing. So we better change the date. So they changed the date. And there's a late 12th century manuscript in, in, in Mount St. Bernard, for example, about, about 1190s, I think, which I had in my bedroom for a whole week, um, which was rather nice, um, along with a 12th century antiphonary. But, um, but that is very clearly 1113. Yeah. And I think, you know, just from, from the sort of personality, what I know of Bernard as a person, he really was a man to join something that was already in the first flush of success. <laughs> you know, he didn't commit himself much to, to sinking ships. Um, I don't think. He didn't have too many. <laughs> uh, he got out of the crusade before it flopped. <laughs> and that may be why it flopped, but while he was with it, it was going terrific. Um, okay. Uh, so he'd been there about two years and decided that was enough being a monk. Um, two years is enough for anybody, he said, so he thought he'd become an abbot. Uh, much more interesting. So he was sent off as, as uh, 1115 to Clairvaux. And in June, he very important contact with one of the heroes of our order uh, is William of Champeau who was the, um, the, the ordinary of, of the diocese uh, in which Clairvaux was, was located. We should really get that man canonized. He was a, he's a minor league theologian of the 12th century. But he gave, he was, he's one of the greatest benefactors of the order because he gave us Bernard. Uh, Bernard was at, at this stage in the process of destroying himself, um, quite simply. Uh, he was, he was uh, on the brink or over the brink of a nervous breakdown. Uh, mainly because he had taken a lot of the spirituality, the sort of one-sided spirituality of the order, too much to heart, and he'd become an extremist. It's all, or some elements of it, are all in this article in Goad and Nail that I've written about. But Bernard is somebody who was rather introspective by nature, you know, sort of added the sort of exercises that drove him more and more inward, instead of compensating and taking him outward. You can see later when he comes to talk about De Diligendo Deo that he prescribes the exact opposite. For interior sort of people, let them go out. Don't drive them in. But whatever that, Bernard was, Bernard's health broke down completely. Um, what's his name? Uh, William attributes it to, to sort of his mysterious ailment. But it, it, it seems to me to be quite quite obviously something that's, that looks very much, and I've talked with people about this who know something about it, says the symptoms look very like uh, a nervous breakdown. And so probably the first nervous breakdown in the order was suffered by Bernard of Clairvaux. 
and um, he was rescued by William of Champeau, the bishop, who went to the general chapter and stamped his little foot on the floor and demanded that Bernard be given directly under his obedience. And, um, and, and so he got him into a little shack out of the monastery and, um, and, uh, and started getting him to look after his own health a bit and taking care of himself and so forth. That's why I say he's really a hero of the order <laughs> because if this reminiscence is true then it means Bernard could really have just ended up on the scrap heap. Um, the fact that he's talented and the fact that he had all sorts of gifts uh, wouldn't have stopped him. Um, so, big hero, number one, William of Champeau. Pray for us. Um, all right, so 1118 September, chronic illness forces Bernard to retire to a solitary hut. To which William of St. Thierry tells us all sorts of people used to go and the monks used to drop out for a chat. Which tells us a little bit about Bernard, that he was the sort of guy that you would go and talk to. Um, not about spiritual things, although he tries to think, but just, just to talk. And it's at that stage that his friendship with William of St. Thierry began. They started uh, exchanging views on, on the, the Song of Songs. Now, Bernard was already very literarily active. From 77 uh, letters are extant from the period 1126, uh, 1116 to 1126. 1119, the foundation of Fontenay. If you've ever be, been to Fontenay, well, you'd know that the, you, the train you get off at, or the big town near it, is Montbar. Excuse me, Montbar. So it's on family land. And it was Bernard's favourite monastery, in many ways. Um, and it still is, I think, one of the most beautiful um, uh, architectural relics of the 12th century. So from about 1121 onwards, you get... get le you get Bernard starting to write the first treatises in praise of the Virgin Mary. Not a bad place to start with Bernard um, if you're not expecting a, a certain type of, of book or a certain type of treatise, but it's a very easy to read. The Apologia, which we'll be looking into, Steps of Humility and Pride on, loving God, on the Necessity of Loving God, De Diligendo Deo, Not on Loving God, uh, not on the love of God. I was very furious with the people in Montreal who, um, in monastic studies, I quoted in an article on the necessity of loving God and they edited it out and just changed it to on loving God. But it stayed diligent or dare, on the God who must be loved, <laughs> on the necessity of loving God. And it's a, a tract about, about God, not about, about our response. So it's a and then the whole question of, of foundations uh, all the time. Writing, foundations, Bernard gets more involved in various things, one after the other, in, in the uh, religio-political controversies of the time against the anti-pope, first skirmish with Abelard, work for the chapter on the Cistercian chant. Interesting thing, Chrysogonus Waddell was telling me, that contrary to what we hear about Bernard, Bernard is responsible for introducing not the pure Milanese uh, Gregorian chant, but most of the things which Bernard introduced were uh, modern music. <laughs> they were popular vernacular melodies which he introduced into a chant rhythm. It's a very, very interesting kind of thing that he wasn't just an archaeologist or a musical archaeologist, but he was interested in, in, in bringing in things that people knew, what we'd say would, would be popular music into the liturgy. And um, Chrysogonus is, 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 is lavishing a, a lot of attention on this particular point. Various other things that are going through, and just working there. In 1144, on, in Epistle 228, Bernard decides never again to leave his monastery. Then 1145, Eugene III becomes Pope. And already that year, there are, there are 235 of his letters uh, gathered together. 6th of April, 1147, Eugene III visited Clairvaux, and Bernard was at home. Um, <laughs> well, it's been known, too, that 
get a distinguished visitor and all sorts of things come out of the woodwork. And um, even abbots. And so, by 1147, Clairvaux's daughter houses had passed the 50th mark. And various other things that he got involved with. 1151, he persuades the general chapter have a procession on the Feast of the Ascension. That's a very interesting incident. Bernard's principal devotion, as we'll see, was to Christ, was under the mystery of the Ascension. And uh, with, with the kind of whimsy of all great men, he was able to use all his power and influence to get the general chapter to add to the number of processions from Palm Sunday and uh, Candlemas, purification. The third one was, was the procession on the Feast of the Ascension as an expression of his own particular devotion. So he was capable of exerting himself on little things as well as great. But then he got iller and iller, and uh, even though his 68th daughter house was founded one week before he died, and then on the 20th of August, coincidentally on the Feast of St. Bernard, he died at 9 o'clock in the morning. Now, we might just finish this section. We'll just flip through the last page. There's nothing much. It's it, things for you to do yourself. <laughs> um, if you want to get interested in the life of St. Bernard and you don't really want to plough through a lot of pious bilge water or hogwash or um, anything like that, one way is to trace the geography of Bernard's movements. And this can be done with Demier's article or elsewhere. But just drawing maps and to see the places that he went and how long he took and just what sort of life he lived Secondly, drawing up lists of persons with whom Bernard had contact or influence. And this included three major categories, kings, princes, and secular powers of various degrees and their wives. To Queen Matilda of England, he wrote, he really felt that he was the father of the, of the, of the, of the, of the royal heir. <laughs> and then says, but not quite that, but by my prayers and so forth. <laughs> But being a little bit forward with writing to royalty, you know, but um, interesting thing about Bernard, that he always wrote to everybody in the same way. And a beautiful element of style. In normal style, if you're writing to an inferior, you would say, Michael the monk to Joe Blow. And as famous Paul, John Paul II to the bishops. The superior gets first. But if you're writing to a superior, you put the superior first, and you say, to, to, to his eminence, Cardinal Ruffini, from uh, Brother Michael, the humble monk of Tarawara. Now, when Bernard, and that was a, a rule that was very rigid, Bernard wrote to everybody, he always put himself as an inferior. If he was writing to a king, obviously, poor Brother Bernard, abbot of, so-called, so-called abbot of Clairvaux. <laughs> Uh, which is rather strange. But if he was writing to a poor widow or to anybody at all, he would do exactly the same. And it's, a ver it's, it's something that's quite extraordinary. He has never written a letter in which it's, he puts himself in a superior place. And it's a very interesting little quirk. So, to kings, to persons of ecclesiastical significance, popes, bishops, abbots on the one hand, saints, leaders and spirituales of both sexes, on the other, like Hildegard of Bingen, whom he didn't quite know what to make of her, but... Um. Then people of intellectual uh, stature who obtained Bernard's patronage and who would later come into prominence, uh, like Robert Poulos, uh, famous in Oxford, and Peter Lombard, and so forth. Apart from these, Bernard had many who were friends, for friendship's sake, as he had circles of acquaintance and relatively few enemies. One of the things Jean Leclerc says about him that I think he says well, he says that for a man who was in the public eye all his life, he died with many friends and few enemies. Relatively few enemies. And that says something about him. Huh? Another way is to look at the church in which he lived, spirit of renewal and so forth. And all these things can help us in understanding Bernard the man and in understanding him as a writer. But I think we'll call it a day there, or call it a morning, and uh, we'll come back this afternoon at 2 o'clock.